So it's a bit more powerful when they say it, <laughs> rather than myself. Um, right, so we just wanted to show that uh, since it didn't work out the first time. Um, but next, I want to introduce you to a former colleague of mine, uh, Rico Kaur. So he is working at the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, or GRES, better known. Um, and he's working on a project called CREM. Uh, it's the Carbon Risk Real Estate Monitor, uh, and he uh, is working on a consortium on this project, uh, funded by the European Commission on Project uh, Horizon 2020, if I'm right. Um, so yeah, let's uh, hand it over to Rick. Thank you, Andrea. So after that, that very emotional video, I'm going to have a slightly more theoretical, data-driven driven presentation, so I, I hope you bear with me. Uh, it's going to be a lot of concepts, and I only have 10 minutes, but I assume you'll share the slides afterwards so you can look at some of the graphs in more detail uh, then. So I work as GRASP, at GRASP as an, as an associate, uh, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with GRASP, but we are a real estate sustainability benchmark, uh, and we benchmark real estate portfolios, but you also have a large asset database. Uh, on which we can see the, the utility data of, of different assets, real estate assets all across the world. Um, but I'm standing here today to talk about CREM. So CREM is the Carbon Risk Real Estate Monitor. And in this project, we are developing uh, a carbon risk ass assessment tool for the European real estate industry uh, for the European Commission. Uh, and this tool is currently under development. We have a, a prototype ready right now. Uh, but in October, we will launch the first pilot version, and in January, it will be ready. It will be an Excel-based tool, but it's going to be underpinned by a lot of research. Um, so I want to, before I dive into some of the academic constructs behind it, uh, I actually want to start off uh, with the New York climate city law. Uh, so uh, perhaps I can see some hands who has heard about this law already. Yeah, okay, great. So uh, at a, a more larger scale, New York City aims to cut uh, climate emissions by 40% by 2030. But the cool thing about this law is that they actually set individual targets for different property types. Uh, and you can see those targets actually here. Uh, and so for these different property types, what they say that if, if you are above an intensity level, which is defined as kilowatt or uh, tons of CO2 divided per square feet, because it's the United States, then you get a certain fine after 2024. Uh, and so this really quantifies transition risk uh, in real estate, because you can really calculate right now, if you don't do anything, what your cost will be uh, in the future. Uh, and so the interesting thing is that with GRASP data, we actually have about a thousand uh, buildings in New York City in our database. And if we look at the, the, the buildings that have enough data, because that's already an issue, we can actually see what the, the cost will be for those different buildings. So I did a very quick calculation here. And in the beginning, uh, real estate investors in New York shouldn't worry too much. Uh, so I think of the 450 buildings that, that qualify here for this law and have enough data, only 2% will be stranded until 2030. But uh, to after 2050, that will be 66%. And in a do-nothing scenario, that will cost annually uh, over 130 million US dollars. So that is relatively significant. I, I don't think quite as significant for, for New York, as these are, are large commercial real estate assets. Uh, but the, the New York City government can also up uh, the price, uh, the penalty per emissions. Um, one more interesting thing to, to add here is that uh, they're actually investigating setting up a cap and trade system that buildings that are very efficient can actually trade their uh, emissions with less efficient assets. Uh, so from that perspective, having an efficient building will actually also be an, an opportunity for you. It, it can bring in money. So uh, now what do we have in Europe? Uh, currently, not yet, but we've uh, built a methodology to identify stranded assets. And that looks a, a lot like um, the, the New York City. So quick recap, what is a stranded asset? Those are properties that will be exposed 
to the risk of early economic obsolescence due to climate change because they will not meet future regulatory efficiency standards requirements, but also market expectations. So our theory basically uh, says that once uh, an asset hits a certain regulatory line or risk line, then uh, stranding risk will, will start to emerge. Uh, and what we aspire to develop is a tool that will identify when uh, an asset is at risk is becoming to become stranded and then offer insights in how uh, a property can be retrofitted to be aligned with so-called science-based decarbonization pathways uh, for the foreseeable future. So that can, for instance, be uh, the Dutch Paris proof standard that uh, Martin uh, will talk about for me afterwards. So uh, what's important to note is that when you retrofit an asset, uh, there will be different benefits that you can expect as an investor. So on the top hand side, you see the, the benefits related to increased regulatory risk, so stranded asset risk. You can have uh, a benefit in terms of uh, cost savings. Uh, then the large gray area is that if you retrofit an asset, those capital expenditures can likely be uh, incorporated into the taxation of the assets and will therefore also impact the transaction value. And finally, there will be a series of indirect benefits, uh, such as, for example, reputational benefits. Uh, some of these elements are, are harder to quantify than others. Um, but we aspire to, to, to give you some indication in the research that we are doing what these different benefits are. Um, now, very important is that if you retrofit an asset, you will probably have an economic break-even point, like it will take a couple of years before it will uh, break even from an economic perspective, the, the energy efficiency, but there will also be an ecological break-even points. Uh, and this is due to the embodied carbon of retrofits. Um, so we also hope to provide some insights into that. Right now there are very little standards in terms of embodied carbon, but you can expect that if uh, electricity grids continue to decarbonize, uh, there will be more of a need to look at things like embodied carbon. Uh, so now on defining that decarbonization pathway, we have published the first report uh, that outlines our theory on how uh, to calculate this. Uh, so what we take is uh, a global decarbonization uh, budget, uh, typically taken from the IPCC. Then we uh, downscale that to uh, an EU level. Uh, so at individual countries, we use an IEA model for that. And then we break that down to um, individual property types. Uh, and this is where our innovation truly comes in, is that uh, right now there are some other decarbonization pathways, for example, uh, with the, the science-based target initiative, but those don't take into account different property types. Uh, and you can expect that it will be a lot more difficult to uh, bring a hotel uh, below uh, a decarbonization target compared to an office, as hotels generally uh, have a lot of associated emissions because they are used very intensely. Uh, so uh, what benefits can the CREM tool uh, that will be released in January bring to, to you? It will be publicly available as an Excel tool. Uh, you can use it for TCFD reporting, uh, it will be specifically tailored also for the private side for uh, general partners and to limited partners reporting. Uh, we hope to provide some insights into capital planning uh, for energetic retrofits. Uh, and finally, we will hope to provide some guidance on standardizing uh, carbon emissions. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you.